feel like something's missing. <laughs> yeah. I act childish sometimes. <laughs> okay. Uh, returning to God. I thought that would be a good uh, message to start off the year with. So in Nehemiah, chapter 1, I think it's, I don't want to say normal, but uh, most Christians do, at some point, fall away from where we should be in our walk with the Lord. Has anybody ever never fallen away? You've always been right on track? No. We all do that. I did that. I know I did that. And uh, I don't believe it's God's will for us to do that. But on the other hand, I know that he does use those times in our lives when we uh, stray uh, for his glory. He uses those to teach us lessons. And uh, he uses, what I've found, is that he uses those times mostly to teach us that we need Him, that we need to rely on Him, that we need our Heavenly Father, don't we? We sure do. I know that I do. Um, the time in my life where I fell away from Him, I pretty much gave up on everything and everyone. I looked for fulfillment and satisfaction and all kinds of stuff, drugs and alcohol and I've talked about that before, but I, I kind of was a little bit drawn into the New Age movement. You know what that is with the rocks and the candles and the crystals and all that stuff? I had, I actually had a, uh, actually I think I've still got this at home somewhere. It's a, uh, a pyramid made out of black onyx. Black onyx, but before I say this, um, last week when me and Carol were in Tennessee, we're in Sevierville. We went to this place called uh, Knife Works. Anybody ever been there? It's an awesome store. They got all kinds of knives and guns and stuff. But uh, anyway, they had this one section with all kinds of rocks and mineral minerals and crystals and things like that. And each bin that has these rocks in it has a little sign in front of it that says the metaphysical properties. Metaphysical properties. This stone causes healing. This stone causes clarity of the mind. <laughs> and I kind of bought into that for a while. But let me tell you something. The rocks. <laughs> <laughs> There's, you know, if you convince yourself that these rocks can do special things, then in your mind they might do that. But the rock is just a rock. There's nothing special about it. And burning candles... Uh, burn a white candle that keeps away evil spirits and uh, certain colored candles. No, they don't. They just smell weird. You know, that's, that's it. But in all that, when I went through all that, I knew it wasn't right. I say I look for ful fulfillment and satisfaction and all those stupid things. But the only place I found... And the only place anybody could find real satisfaction and real peace is in Jesus Christ. That's the only place. These rocks. It amazes me that people look to the rocks when you can look to the people, look to the one that made that rock for fulfillment. And that's where you'll find it. So, but all the stupid things that I did, I know that he was protecting me. I know that God was there protecting me. If he hadn't been, I don't know where I would be right now. Most likely I would not be right here, right now. I was out of his will, and he used that time in my life to strengthen my testimony and to show me, without a doubt, that I need him. He's the only one I need. Jesus Christ is the only one I need in my life. So let's read... Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. And Bob, you're exempt from standing if you don't want to. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hagaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Verse 3, and they said, the cap and they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all that you are, all that you do, that in times where we turn away from you, in times where we fail, in times where we fall short, we can always turn back to you. And you're calling us to turn back to you. And we pray that you work in this service, that you would work in the minds and hearts of everyone here um, to bring us back to you. And if we know anybody uh, that used to come to church here that doesn't come anymore or has fallen away, that you can guide us in uh, giving us the right words to say to bring them back to you where they should be. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So my first point is, I have two points in this message. My first point is, uh, God uses us to reach backslidden believers. God uses us to reach backslidden believers. Nehemiah had a job that was not exactly a desirable job. He was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes. The cupbearer. His job description was this. Don't die. That's pretty much it. <laughs> At this time in history, the kings, uh, they would have enemies. And the enemies would try to kill the king. And they would try everything, including poisoning their food and poisoning their drink. And it was the cupbearer's job, Nehemiah. It was his job to taste the king's food and drink for him. If Nehemiah tasted it and didn't die, it was okay for the king to eat now. If you read on in chapter 2, Nehemiah says that he had never been sad in the king's presence. That's in chapter 2, verse 1. It seems to me that just having that job would be a reason to be sad. <laughs> so Nehemiah, as we can see from these first four verses, that he was a man who loved his Jewish heritage. His brother, Hanani, and some of the others came to visit, and they told Nehemiah about the condition of the walls in Jerusalem. They had been neglected. They had been damaged during attacks on the city, and they were basically falling apart. That broke Nehemiah's heart. It was a reflection of the relationship the Jews had with God at that time. They had fallen away. They had fallen away from following God. Nehemiah asked his brother about the condition of Jerusalem. Why? Because he cared. Because he loved his Jewish heritage. Verse 2 says, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Nehemiah was in Persia, which is today uh, Iraq, I think. Is it Iran or Iraq? I think it's Iran, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. One of the two. Iraq or Iran, one of the two. But he was there, he was in Persia, but his heart, his mind, his interest was in Jerusalem, 800 miles away. He wanted to, wanted to know from Hannah and I and those uh, that he was talking to how they were doing in the city. He loved the remnant of Jews. He cared for them. When we care about somebody, we ask, 
because we love them, because we want the facts. We want to know how they're doing. We want to know what's going on in their lives, not just for gossip, not just for um, idle curiosity, but we want to know because we love them and because we care. We want to know so we can see if we can do anything to help. Nehemiah cared. He cared enough to ask about Jerusalem. He cared enough to cry for Jerusalem. He cared enough to pray and fast for Jerusalem. He prayed for their forgiveness. And he prayed that they would return to God so that he would bless them and protect them again. How much do you care about your brothers and sisters in Christ? Think about that for a second. How much do you really care? Do you truly care? Do you care about those who've fallen away? I mentioned earlier that we all know of people that used to come to this church. Where you come here on Sunday morning, the place was filled, and they're not here anymore. Why? Have we reached out to them? Do we care enough to reach out to them? Do we care enough to ask them? We can contact them in so many different ways today. We can email them. We can call them. We can send them a card or a letter. But asking, caring, loving, and praying. And praying is so much, it's such an important thing. Uh, God will use you and me to reach these people. Sometimes it takes loving, caring, and a word from us, someone who really cares, who truly loves them and cares for them. That's what happened in 1987 with a young lady named Donna Rice. You guys remember this? It was a political scandal. She had an affair with uh, Gary Hart. You guys remember this? Um, when she was younger, she was involved in church, and she was in a youth group, and went in on mission trips, and uh, choir, and inviting her friends to church. And After she went to college, like happened so many times, she fell away. She gradually began to fall away from her Christian faith. Then, the affair came to light. Her and this Gary Hart. Her life fell apart. This was in the newspaper, the media, all over the place. She was hounded by the press and offered millions to tell her story. She was at a point where she had lost hope, and she didn't know where to turn. Everywhere she looked, she saw her own name being smeared all over the place. <coughs> One day she was talking to her mother and her grandmother, and they told her something that should have been obvious to her. They said, before you make any decisions, get your life straight with God. Donna thought about that and said she was stunned. She said she hadn't realized yet that she could put the entire thing in God's hands and he would take care of it. Then her mother gave her a cassette that was made for her by a former a youth group friend from the church and her friend said on the tape Donna I imagine you're in a lot of pain right now I just want you to know that God loves you and I love you Donna said that when she heard the songs on the tape that they used to sing in the church choir in the youth group she fell to the floor and cried she said these are her own words I knew that I and no one else was responsible for my choices. I cried out, God, it took me falling on my rear in front of the whole world for you to get my attention. Help me to live life your way. And God answered that prayer. And she is now living life God's way. The people that have fallen away, have slipped away from God, can be restored. God loves his children, and he wants us to come to him. 
Just like a parent. When a parent loves their child, their child goes astray and turns their back on, on you, it hurts, doesn't it? You ever had that happen to you? I know for a fact it hurts. But God, the Father, just like us as fathers and mothers, want our kids to come to us. Want our kids to be a big part of our lives. But sometimes when we fall away, we can continue in that lifestyle, continue in that sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. But God has provided a way, one way, to avoid that death sentence. And that's through Jesus Christ. The only way. Look at the parable, parable of the lost sheep in Matthew 18. The parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. God's love is always willing to forgive and take back those that are his. There are those today that will teach you that we serve a God that, you know, you can be his, and then the next day you can mess up, and God will say, you know, you've lost your salvation. I'm done. I'm so glad that's not true. If somebody is a child of God and you slip away, he wants you to come back to him. He's not going to turn his back on you. You will turn your back on him at times. I know that because I did it. But he will never turn his back on you. He will never do that. He is more than willing to take back his lost sheep. He's waiting for us to come back. We're to do all we can to let the backslidden, backslidden believer know that we care and that God loves them, and he wants them back. Here in the book of Nehemiah, God used a regular guy like Nehemiah to do his work. And God can use you in the same way. God can use you. He wants to use you to reach out to those backslidden believers. Do you know somebody who's fallen away? We all do, I'm sure. I know I do. Do you know a church member that needs to come back? We all do. I guarantee it. How about somebody that's not saved? You know somebody that's not saved? I know lots of people that are not saved. Pray for them. Pray for them. Reach out to them. He will use you to accomplish his will in the lives of other Christians who have fallen away. So my second point is God wants the ones who have fallen away to return to him. He wants the ones who have fallen away to return to him. God saw what needed to be done in Jerusalem. He knew what needed to be done, but nothing would be done until the right man also saw that need. That right man was just an average guy, Nehemiah. Nehemiah with a heart for God and with a heart for his people. God would do something great to meet the need of those people in Jerusalem through Nehemiah. When we as Christians turn from God, in most cases, most cases we know what we should be doing, but we just don't do it. I believe... That's where the Israelites were at this point in time. They were doing what they do best, turning from God. We see it all through the, New, the Old Testament. They'd follow God, turn from God. God would punish them. They would come back to God over and over and over. That's what would happen. And there's times when we do the same thing. I've heard it said that when you stop running from God, and turn to him, you'll find that he's right there waiting for you. And I know that from experience. I ran from God for all those years in uh, what I call my stupid years. I ran from God. 
But when I finally decided, when the Spirit convicted me to come back to Him, He was right there waiting. I didn't have to go very far. He was right there. He's right there. When a believer backslides, we fall into a less than desirable condition. I know that's what happened with me. And we might find ourselves in a condition that God doesn't want his children in. Sometimes we might be led astray by false teachings, by, like I was talking about, the new age with the rocks and crystals and stuff. And then sometimes it could be something just of our, our own doings, our own rebellion that will lead us there outside of God's will. Either way, it can be a very destructive uh, thing to our spiritual growth as a Christian. Sometimes it will completely hinder our growth. And in any case, it's vitally important that you find your way back to God. In the Old Testament, in the Old, uh, Old Testament, the nation of Israel did it, like I said, over and over and over. But every single time, God would take them back. God would accept them back. They would turn to God. They would turn from God, suffer consequences, and turn to God. The reason Nehemiah was troubled about the condition of Jerusalem was because the Jewish people were doing what they do best, rebelling against God. They had once again turned away from their God. And we see in 2 Kings 25 that the Babylonians had destroyed Jerusalem walls, gates, and temples. And 50 years later, 50 years later, a group of Jews had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild those walls, and uh, they didn't finish it. They didn't, they, their work was delayed. The temple was worked on, but the gates and the walls were never completed. And that's what bothered Nehemiah. God wanted the work done. God wanted his city complete. And it's the same with us. God wants us as individuals to be complete before him. He wants the church to be complete before him. Look around right now. Is this a complete church? God has work for us to do. Each and every one of us. Everybody sitting in this room, God has something for you to do. We all have difficult times in our life. Then in, the enemy works hard at taking our focus off Jesus. The enemy works hard, especially in these last days, to break up the church, to break up the family. In some cases, he's succeeding. But we need to do all we can to get the church, to get our families, to get everything and everybody we know back on track with God. We all know the prodigal, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15. If you look at that, that story, you can see that the, the son took his inheritance. He wasted it. He just blew it on junk. And then when it was gone, he realized what a big mistake he had made, and he wanted to go back to his father. And when he did come back, his father was there waiting on him. It says in uh, Luke 15, verse 20, but while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. While the son was a st still a long way off, his father saw him. This indicates that the father was watching for him. He was looking for him. That's what God does with us. He looks for us to come back to him. And once we make that first step to come back to God, he runs to meet us. And in this day, when Jesus gave this parable, that was a big thing. A man did not run. Men don't run in that society. They're above that. He's, he was so excited, this father, to see his son coming back to him that he ran. 
that doesn't really seem unusual to us to see men run, but it was socially unacceptable in that day. It would be like today seeing a man skip. That would be weird, wouldn't it? <laughs> I come home from work every day and see Carol and hi Carol, I'm home. <laughs> Yeah, I don't skip much. <laughs> it just isn't right. So if you've turned away from God, or if you know somebody that's turned away from God or wandered out of his flock, we need to reach out to him. Show him our love, our compassion, our care that can only be found in Jesus Christ. We need to return to God. They need to return to God. Like I said, I had turned away for many years of my life. And the best decision that I could do, best decision I could make, was to turn back to God and come back to God. And I remember the moment the Lord called me back, back up here. I was living in Florida, and uh, I came up here on vacation, I think. I was sitting on my brother's porch in Kell, right in the middle of Kell, and uh, it was so peaceful and quiet. I was sitting on his porch swing. It was just like this, peace and quiet. I could hear crickets, and the Lord just impressed it upon my heart. I want to come home. I want to come home. And when I got back up here, I got back into going to church, and that's when he called me to preach. So I know it was of the Lord to bring me back here. He wants to do the same for all of his children. People look everywhere for satisfaction, fulfillment. I've heard people say, what is the meaning of life? Have you ever had anybody ask you that? What is the meaning of life? The meaning of life is two words. Serve God. Follow God. That's what it is. With today being New Year's Eve, I can tell you that uh, I stopped making New Year's resolutions about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, because every time I did, I'm going to lose weight this year. I'd gain weight. I'd start, I'm going to start working out more. And I wouldn't. Every time, every time I would but I made one, and I make the same one every year. Two words, follow God. That's my New Year's resolution. Every day, every year, every week, follow God. That's what I want to do. Is that what you want to do? Follow God? God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God has plans for you. God has plans for every Christian. The ones that used to sit in these pews every Sunday morning, God has a plan for them. And it's a plan that if they follow it, they will be blessed beyond belief. So here's my challenge. Do you know someone who's gone astray? Do you know someone who's fallen away from the path God has set before them? Pray for them. And if you can, pray with them. That's an important step right there. When our loved ones are on the wrong path, they need the support and encouragement of us, of other believers. They need that. If you can, go and talk to them. Sometimes they'll shut you out of their life. But like I said before, you can always call them, you can text them, you can email them, you can you know, do whatever. Sometimes that doesn't work, though, because they don't want to hear the truth. Or maybe they don't want to hear the truth from you. God's grace and love covers everything. And when we see and feel his love, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like it. That's what God made us for to follow him, and to serve him. So if you know somebody that has gone astray, pray for them. And if you can, 
like I said, sometimes we can't go talk to them. Invite them to church. Tell them we got a new pastor that's kind of goofy. <laughs> so let's stand and have a word of invitation. And as always, this altar is open for prayer. If you want to come and pray, if you want to come and pray for yourself, if you want to pray for somebody else that uh, has, God has put on your heart for this during this message, please do that. So but let's have a word of prayer. Page 430.